Well, thanks, thanks for coming, everybody, to chat about um, Williston. I'm going to jump right in, and I'm really going to try to talk fast and, and blaze through my slides so there's time for Q&A. So I've asked for a wave at around the halfway point. If I speed up all of a sudden, it's because I've gotten that wave, and I'm trying to get us to um, question and answer. Oop, did I get it right? I did. Okay. So uh, my name is Matt Boulanger. I'm the planning director in Williston. I've worked in Williston for um, the last 15 years. Um, and I'm going to be talking mostly about Taft Corners today. Uh, in that map you see there, that's the area under the red shading. The big red line around the whole rest of it is the boundary of the entire town. And I just want to note that I'm talking about one part of the town today in that red area. Um, and also note that that's about 840 acres. Uh, we have over almost two and a half times that number of acres in the green area in the rest of the town permanently conserved. So a lot of folks, when they think about Williston, they may think about the part they drive to and, and shop in. Uh, that's the red part. We're going to talk about that today. Um, but there really is a whole other rest of the town out there. And this also really illustrates um, sort of politically, infrastructurally, Williston is a small town becoming a big town. Um, and I would guess I would add to that in terms of its identity as well. And that might play into some of the tools that I talk about a little bit today. So I've broken this up roughly into three sections. There they are. Let's jump in. Uh, challenges and opportunities here in Taft Corners. First challenge, too much parking. Anybody who's been there has seen, uh, maybe it was nice when you went there to shop uh, on Black Friday because it was easy to park and go get your shopping done. Um, but we have an awful, awful, awful lot of parking in Taft Corners. Uh, we sent the Planning Commission out in 2018 to take pictures of it on Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, and they found lots of nearly empty parking lots. Um, obviously, this stuff just sits there making storm water. Um, it gets in the way of building a more walkable land use pattern. Um, and it costs money. It costs money to maintain for the businesses that are there. So it's one of our big challenges in Williston. What's the opportunity in that? Well, there's lots of places to put new stuff because we got lots of surface parking we don't need. Um, and this is just one visualization of that, looking over at Maple Tree Place and imagining a reworking of a single parking lot in that shopping center into um, four-story mixed-use uh, buildings with a parking structure on the inside. Um, so there's a great, great amount of opportunity in places where we don't have buildings fronting streets the way we'd like to, where we have parking fronting street, we have places we can put buildings. Uh, another huge challenge in Taft Corners and especially, you know, just Williston town-wide, not enough homes. This is a challenge in the United States, it's a challenge in New England, it's a challenge in Vermont, it's a challenge in Williston. Um, but we are, we are uniquely um, challenged in Williston. That yellow bar down near the bottom of that graph is us. This is the homes jobs balance. 92% um, of jobs worked in Williston are worked by people who do not live in Williston, and a very large percentage of those are, are jobs that pay a wage whereby people cannot afford to live in Williston. So we have an equity issue and we have a housing issue, and it's quite acute in Williston. That's the challenge. The opportunity, there's demand. We've got that tiny little vacancy rate, often hovering under 1%. People have a reason to want to come into Taft Corners and reimagine that area. And this is just one picture of a, of a reimagining of some un and underdeveloped land in Williston that could be infilled and could help us meet that housing need while also bringing that more walkable development pattern to the town. Another challenge, a lot of Taft Corners is not terribly walkable or bikeable and we have limited transit. That's a picture of Route 2A. Uh, we got some buildings on the street there, but it's still not a very nice place to walk, certainly not a nice place to ride. Um, but again, there's interest in development here. There's demand. That means there's energy to build new infrastructure if we're willing to conceptualize it and in some cases require it or go after producing it. Another challenge, we got big box stores in Williston. We haven't built a big box store in Williston in nearly 30 years, but we have the ones that came in the 90s. And we don't think that's a terribly economically or structurally resilient development pattern. We're at the mercy of national trends when these things go out. This is the town uh, planning office, bed, bath, and beyond replacement bedding pool 
Um, and one of the things about this picture, first off, uh, Spirit Halloween is a free space, and yeah, it's, it's in that building right now. Uh, second off, this is four or five of us on the staff trying to figure out what might go into Bed Bath & Beyond. We couldn't even fill half the squares. Uh, you can vote if you want. Um, <laughs> I'll take questions on that at the end. Um, but, you know, some of the pattern in Taft Corners is this really rigid, really non-resilient thing um, that we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to infill around it. And we hope someday there will be enough interest, maybe after some of that infill comes in, in maybe adapting it. And if, if not outright bulldozing it and reworking those blocks, maybe doing something like the picture here. So, some tools and strategies. This is, you know, what I just went over are some challenges that have been facing Williston around Taft Corners. Uh, they're not especially new challenges. They've certainly been evident for the last decade or so. Um, what do we do about it? So the first thing um, is the zoning fix, form-based codes uh, for predictable, predictability, pattern, and parking, uh, but mostly parking behind the building. What do we want to do? We want to build new streets and form walkable blocks in Taft Corners. We want buildings to be up on the street. We want those buildings to relate well to the street by having windows and balconies and things like that. Uh, we want the parking behind the building and we want the access to happen on an alley so those streets don't have lots and lots of curb cuts interrupting our bike and walk uh, travelers along the street. So the form-based code uh, that we worked on for Willison, which I'll talk about more in a bit, it's 120 pages long. But these couple of bullets is, is really the, the distilled um, ingredients of what that code does and how it's different from the kind of zoning Williston had in Taft Corners before. Uh, you'll notice there's a couple of bullets missing from this list. We're not talking about how many dwelling units per acre are allowed in Taft Corners anymore. We're talking about how many floors you can build. We're not talking about floor area ratio. We're talking about how much private open area do you need to provide for residents of those buildings and can you fit that on the site along with putting all your parking behind. So form-based, uh, we're not really thinking about regulating use. We're not even really thinking about regulating intensity, at least not in terms of measuring how many of something is happening in the building. We're just thinking about the building size. So those are the main ingredients to our form-based code and I can, I can talk for hours on that, so I'm not going to. Other big tool, um, and this is one that I would pitch to any Vermont municipality that doesn't have one, official maps. Um, Williston, until a few years ago, until a year ago, did not have an official map. This is a Vermont-specific tool. It's in statute. Vermont communities may plan for future public facilities and put those facilities, like roads, parks, um, and other things, on what's called an official map. They can map these things on privately owned land. And if they do that, and if they adopt that map, when developers come in to develop those lands, they can ask the developer to accommodate that facility in the location as it's shown on the official map. So if we want to develop a, a block pattern in Taft Corners, we need to map some streets on other people's land. Um, and we need to ask them to accommodate that when they build. Now, there are some mechanisms if the owner says, absolutely not, you can't make me. Um, the select board gets a limited amount of time to say, well, we'll try to buy it from you. Um, if, they, if they do that, it's kind of like having a right of first refusal. Uh, but in practice, what folks have told me who uh, have and have been implementing official maps in Vermont is most of the time, private sector goes along with these maps because there are infrastructure investments that can come with it. There's, there's fitting a pattern that can come with it, and it ends up being advantageous to them to follow that official map. So along with our form-based code in Williston that was adopted a year ago, we adopted an official map. Um, I always roll this little story about Daniel Burnham out. Uh, everybody's heard some version of the make no little plans or make, make no small plans, make big plans, yada, yada, quote uh, that Daniel Burnham is famous for having stated. And everybody remembers make no little plans. But my favorite part of this quote is about official maps. I don't think he knew he was saying that when he said it but that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, but long after we are gone will be a living thing asserting itself with ever-growing insistency. Planners, if you get to work in a community where you get to map out where the streets are gonna go, you are doing 
old school planning that dates back over a thousand years. It is really, really cool. And if that infrastructure pattern can be set and development can happen along that pattern, which is often a grid, it's very boring, it works really well. Um, the other things that make a place walkable, bikeable, dense enough to support transit will come along. So that's my favorite part of Daniel Burnham's quote. It's the noble diagram part. There's our noble diagram for Taft Corners. So what you see there in orange, yellow, and red are existing roads and streets, but also planned new roads and streets that create a grid of walkable blocks, generally not more than 400 feet to a side. That's just a sort of a human scale metric. Um, this is the pattern we would like development to slot into as it comes into Taft Corners under our new form-based code. You'll also notice some little green spaces there. Those are planned parks. They are on other people's land. They're on privately owned land. Uh, Williston today has no public park of any kind in Taft Corners. We're talking about the town in the state of Vermont that has the highest single volume of retail sales of any municipality in the state. 24, 25,000 people per day, daytime population, no public open spaces today. Um, and so we mapped a few on here. If we're gonna have a whole bunch of people living and working here, they've gotta have places to be. Keep in mind this code was adopted um, in the aftermath of the pandemic. We talked a lot with our planning commission about the way people need to be able to use a space, the way spaces need to be adaptable to changing circumstances. Um, and we mapped that in. So that's, that's our official map. And we were doing it in Taft Corner, so why not do it for the whole town? Um, this tool let us uh, engage with a citizen group, a, a temporary mobility, sort of a proto bike ped committee that we stood up. Um, it let us get on the map all of the town's collected desires for multi-use paths, trails, uh, filling sidewalk gaps both in and out of Taft Corners. Um, it let us identify what things had been scoped and which things had not. And um, that really excites me because we can now take this map as we roll into our overall townwide comprehensive planning process uh, that, we're, that we're coming into very soon called Williston 2050. And I have bumper stickers for you all if you want them that say Williston 2050 and bookmarks with some, of, uh, some links to our website. We, we talk to everybody about the town plan. Um, we can take this official map, we can take the unbuilt facilities on this, and we can start prioritizing and really thinking about how to build a more complete network or just what metric we're gonna use to prioritize our facilities. We've never done that before. So like I said, this was adopted. Um, it became effective on October 22nd of 2022. It's not even a year old yet. I wanna talk a little bit next about some next steps. And yes, I said the dirty word in a public meeting in Williston, I said city. <laughs> and the paper, of course, of everything I said, quoted it, and there's the, there's the poll quote. Um, there's gonna be some density if we're gonna get that walkability, if we're gonna achieve some of the other town's goals. I haven't even talked about housing, um, but that's a big piece of this as well, obviously. So. Some results, uh, early results of the adoption of the form-based code uh, and the official map and some future steps uh, we're looking at. Uh, one is looking at new streets. This is one of those streets that doesn't exist yet that's on our official map, Trader Lane. I got hired in Williston in 2008 and somebody sat down and they said, yeah, we're gonna try to build this road called Trader Lane. It should happen in a couple of years. Um, no, not, not in a couple of years. Um, it's happening not under construction now, but under design for permitting and cost estimation purposes uh, as a public-private partnership between the town and the majority landowner owner of the land we would need to build Trader Lane on. I really believe that the reason it's happening now is because we got through a rezoning process that created a whole bunch of potential value on the land adjacent to this road. Um, we went from three stories and no more than seven and a half homes per acre to four or five or even almost five and a half stories in some cases with mixed use, um, with lower parking requirements, with a whole bunch of things that mean maybe it's really worth it for that landowner to say, hey, let's work with the town to build this street so we can unlock the potential um, value of this land. 
So we're moving forward, first little baby steps, biggest steps that have happened in my whole 15 years in Williston towards actually building this piece of infrastructure. And um, I just want, for anybody who was in Jesse Baker's session, we didn't coordinate. I used the exact same font and PowerPoint template for mine. And the other part I'm gonna say is I view Trader Lane as our market street, as you know, the, the success of South Burlington, if we can achieve three quarters of that on Trader Lane, I think we will have taken Williston uh, uh, on a really big step towards achieving its goals. Um, we also have people proposing buildings under the new form-based code. And in the case of this particular one that's sitting on my desk under review, also taking uh, advantage of some of the Act 47 changes that came through the legislature last summer. So one of those things said, if you're 20% affordable, um, you get an extra story statewide. So this fellow who was um, working on this mixed use building that was gonna be five stories says, fine, make it six. And he comes in, this is 59 units, 12 of them would be affordable at 80% AMI. Um, we'll see if it gets built. I haven't signed a permit yet. We're in early stages of review. Um, this is not the nicest looking side of the building. In fact, this is probably the ugliest side of this building because it's where the parking deck entrance is. But I needed a vertical orientation picture to fit on the slide. Um, new connections. Uh, the area in this dotted uh, spot here is some land that was dedicated to the town of Williston uh, around 1993 by the developers of Maple Tree Place for the express purpose of creating a transit center. Town was pretty forward thinking back then. Town kind of lost its way over the years. We very, very nearly leased this to the owners of Maple Tree Place to build an expanded parking lot at one point because, hey, it's just sitting in there and it's not doing anything for us. Um, We've moved on from that um, and, and we've gone out and looked at the feasibility of building some infrastructure that could support a transit hub in this location. Um, so now there's a picture of it. There's a picture of it we can use to talk to with our decision makers um, and to envision this sort of center of Taft Corners becoming more of a hub of mo multimodal activity. Um, we have at least studied the idea of taking over the design and jurisdiction of the state highways that intersect and form the center of Taft Corners. Um, this is a study uh, pilot program Williston participated in over the last couple months. Uh, we have a desired street section for Route 2 in Williston that looks like the one you see on the bottom of the slide there. Uh, we cannot do that if that road continues to you know, be maintained and controlled exclusively by, by VTrans as a state highway. Uh, and there is a price tag to this. It's a little over 20,000 bucks a mile uh, in uh, operation and maintenance costs for a town to take on a road like this, let alone to rebuild it into the, the street we'd actually like it to be. But again, at least the vision is there, the picture is there. Maybe eventually the grand list value is there in Taft Corners um, to you know, give us a reason to, to go and do something like that. We, all the plows are dump trucks. So I think it's lane width. It's a lot lane width. Um, we didn't get a very robust conversation about, well, how much would you let us do to the street and still keep it? It was more like, you guys take it if you want to do any of this. Uh, the other thing is to build that grid I showed. There's a lot of curb cut intersects with the state highway that um, VTrans wouldn't be in favor of. That building I showed is on a planned street that would intersect with Route 2A. The plan for right now under our rules is that would just stay a right in, right out, because that's what VTrans can live with. So not taking on those state highways presents some limitations to the sort of the full realization of the vision um, of the code. We've also participated in um, modeling microtransit. Uh, and you know, in terms of thinking about, again, we are a whole town. We want everybody to benefit from and be able to access Taft Corners. Um, you know, this is sort of beyond the growth center itself, although the, red, the blue and green lines there do certainly intersect within it. Um, but starting to think about how do we make sure, and I had a couple planning commission members who are very concerned about this, that we don't become the city of Taft Corners surrounded by the town of Williston, but that there's this really nice, you know, I can live in Taft Corners and get on my bike and be in the woods riding at Catamount 10 minutes later, having accessed it on a safe uh, facility. Or I can live in rural Williston and I can go, you know, get to my job in Taft Corners. So one of the ideas is to think about microtransit or other creative ways to connect people. And that's it. I know I went a little over my 15. We've got some time for questions, though, and uh, apologies for going so fast. 
Marshall. How did you get community buy-in, and how did you deal with criticism? Sorry. <laughs> I didn't sleep a lot for two years. Uh, that's how I dealt with criticism. Um, no, um, you know, the project to create these tools, the form-based code and the official map, was um, supported uh, by a consultant, by CCRPC's work plan. It was a, a total $120,000 project. Our consultant team in, in the midst of the pandemic did a fantastic job doing massive amounts of public outreach. As one select board member said, this is more outreach I've ever seen done on any one issue in Williston. And getting all of those voices in the room, getting people to dialogue with one another in different ways, and I think also giving the project the breathing space it needed, um, working with the Planning Commission, then doing a big concentrated public engagement push, um, it was like in the spring of 21, and then a really long glide path writing the code with the Planning Commission after that, and another six to eight month glide path of going over that code in bite-sized pieces with the select board who would ultimately need to vote to adopt it so that they, you know, we're talking about architectural standards and words like fenestration and street wall, and you got to have a lot of time built in um, to bring everybody along with that vision. And that's the other part is out of our public engagement, we had a thing called the vision plan, sort of an engagement report prepared by the consultant. So there was a document that said, coming out of this, here's our vision. And we could go to the select board and say, do you endorse us moving forward with turning this vision into regulatory language and turning it into a plan? And they said yes, and then we went and did it. So lots of little decision points along the way. I wrote the select board a memo at one point in this process and said, here's the 10 things you guys are gonna hate the most about this thing. Let's talk about them. Tell me, tell me where my limits are so that we don't waste time um, afterwards. I saw it in the back there. Um, do you mind using the microphone so we can catch the audio and the recording? Thank you. Thanks. So I've looked at Williston's um, tax situation, municipal tax situation, and um, Last time I looked a couple of years ago, a significant portion, I think it was a third of the budget, was paid by the local option tax, which is largely because of the nature of Williston, is paid from people that do not live in the town. That looks like it's going to be changing. I wonder, with all the new housing that's going to be built and now more residents in the town, they will A, be paying the local option tax, and B, the budget looks like it's going to increase significantly as well with the services that those folks will want. What kind of conversations are going on about how that incredibly low municipal property tax rate that Williston enjoys is likely to change? Well, I think the first thing is um, the current select board is pretty dedicated to not changing it. Um, they, they have been pretty clear they don't want to see the budget increase stratospherically. Um, we have to think a lot about what are the things that generate cost for the town. Um, so we do get a little under a third of our budget from the local option sales tax. And we do view that as being pretty volatile um, because it comes from you know, food and hospitality as well as uh, those big box stores. Um, we hope Williston remains a compelling enough place for those things to exist. And I, I mean, the, the nice thing is there's not like another Taft Corners, two exits down the highway. There's, there's one place to go to do that stuff, um, and, and, and for better or worse, we're it. So um, we think those things will wind down over time, but not overnight. We think we can you know, kind of manage that. And then in terms of demand for services, if you look at the municipal budget, about 45% of that budget is emergency services. Right now, um, our police are spending most of their time dealing with retail theft in the big box stores that were built 30 years ago. Um, our emergency services spend a lot of time at this sort of like low service concierge senior housing where if anything happens to anyone in the building, the concierge picks up the phone and dials 911. Um, so sort of regular old apartment buildings with small scale ground floor retail are not huge generators of that cost. Um, another 27% of the municipal budget is public works. Um, and it is basically a per mile cost to, um, plow and, and occasionally repave and restripe roads. That's, that's most of what we do with that budget. Um, well, that one, that one in particular, so you talked about picking up 2A as becoming a town road. 
that's going to make a big change, I would think. Yeah, it would be another, you know, mile and a half of road if we were to do that. Um, what I want to say about roads is it's all about whether there's bang for the buck in, in taking on that road. So if you're going to build a mile of road in Williston, this is back of the envelope and don't quote me on it, you need $64 million of grand list value on that road. Otherwise, you're spending more than that road's fair share to plow that road. And, you know, we have a, we have a subdivision in Williston that's about 30 years old. Every single house in it's worth over a million dollars. Um, it doesn't pay for itself. We have a double wide and single wide mobile home park in Williston with all private roads that's subsidizing that other sub subdivision. Now, when we get into Taft Corners, when we look at some of the things that have already been built, even just under our performance standards we had before the, the form based code, the value density just goes through the roof. Um, so we might build some new roads. We might make some decisions about taking on some new roads at, at some point, although I think that state highway conversation is probably quite a long ways out. But when we build new road to serve new development in the form based code, we might be building um, 150 feet of new road to serve $20 million of new grand list value. So I think the proposition there is, is pretty solid. Um, I, I, if I was going to be worried about the municipal rate, the thing I'm most worried about is probably the volatility of that local option sales tax um, because so, so much of that comes from the retail traffic. Um, the other things, I think there's going to be a reasonable rate of growth where the town can kind of scale with it. Last point on uh, taxes, the single biggest source of additional cost year over year in Williston's and probably most municipal budgets is just the cost of doing what you're already doing. Asphal you know, a pile of road salt costs more, health insurance for employees costs more. Um, so when I look at how much our town budget is increasing year over year, there's a very, very small sliver of that pie that's about adding, you know, another FTE to public works so we can plow more sidewalks or, you know, another cop or, or something like that. A lot of it is just, just like us as individuals, the cost of, the cost of living as a town keeps going up. The development of the Taft Corners, uh, is there any way that you will be trying to generate uh, owner, uh, you said you're not talking about the internal, you know, whatever you choose to build. build. Uh, and South Burlington is great, as you said, it's, fan, it's fantastic. But it's pretty predominantly all leased, mm -hmm. and, it's pretty, and it's pretty much all denominantly uh, focused on a couple of groups based on who has controlled the ownership of that house. If you're trying to build a more sort of sustainable buy-in, by per you want a good, healthy mix of ownership and rental. You need both. Mm -hmm. They both bring value. You also need sort of an entry point for a younger generation to build equity by maybe buying a, a, a one-bedroom or, or something you know, small in nature and over time accumulate. Is there any way you're trying to affect that equation uh, in Taft Corner? Sure, so I brought this map back up because um, I can talk about the different development types that are allowed uh, in the different code areas a little bit and then just sort of a more general sense. Um, so number one, yeah, we're not, we're not regulating um, you know, own or rent here and, and I think we will get a lot of rental. Um, you know, the balance in Williston of homes has been traditionally so very heavily pitched towards single family on a half acre center hall colonial ownership only that um, we're a long way from having too much rental in that mix. Um, affordable, you know, duplex or any sort of ownership unit is definitely a bigger challenge. So um, on this map around the fringes, you see some yellow and, and lighter orange. Um, some of that's pre-existing, some of that's speculative. Um, but in those areas, the taller building forms are not as available and you're looking much more at a row home type configuration. And we actually have some built row home pattern um, under our last version of zoning as well. One of the things we did to try to um, make that a more economical ownership option is we have those row homes. So you could have you know, two, four, six homes sharing common walls. Um, 
and they could be up to three stories tall. We want you to park, you know, in, in the back, that sort of thing. Every one of those row homes can have an accessory dwelling unit under this code. So there's a potential revenue stream. There's a potential flexibility there. Um, that, I think, is really great. Now, nor normally, and under the rest of our conventional zoning, you can only have an accessory dwelling unit if you're a single-family home. Um, so that's a little bit of it. Um, a little bit of it is, I think, just, just giving everybody as much flexibility as we can to, to build what they see the market uh, as needing. But we do have some other built forms in Williston already. Uh, we have these sort of three-story flats buildings that, that get built, um, and the row home form, and some other kind of interesting ones that seem to just lend themselves a little better to ownership than the traditional, um, you know, 65 foot deep, double wide um, apartment building. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see if we need to get in, you know, as the government and, and try to manipulate that any more than we have. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.